Hi, I'm Danny with Tax29 Tax Service. And I'm Andy. You know, Danny, the prices of everything keeps going up and up. Inflation. Well, at Tax29, we said enough. We're keeping our pricing structure the same this year as what we had last tax season. So whether you file in one of our local offices or whether you file with us online at tax29.com, you'll get the same professional tax prep at affordable pricing along with year-round service. For a list of our pricing or to find out more, stop by one of our local offices or visit us at tax29.com. What's the real story? How did all of this come to be? Was it all by chance or did something or someone design everything? Join us as we learn from our host, William Henry, and discover that the story of the Earth and our universe is really his story. Welcome to Discovering His Story, a production of Youngstown Christian Television. In Discovering His Story, we place the Bible and secular history side by side and see where they interact with one another and learn about history and also learn some background information for the Bible and helps us to understand that better as well. And at the same time, giving us a greater confidence in God's Word as uh, revealing what real people were doing in real society and culture. We are uh, looking at the time of history, which we call ancient times. In ancient times, uh, there were a number of civilizations that we've gone through. Uh, one of which is uh, Greece. Um, and we're looking at Greece, ancient Greece, and, and have a lot to look at concerning the culture of Greece and see that it's a, a foundation for much of what we uh, have in our Western culture up to the present day. Uh, the last time uh, we were looking at some of the philosophers of ancient Greece, uh, and particularly we ended with the philosophers of Plato and Aristotle. Now, the, Plato was the teacher of Aristotle, and yet they came to totally divergent views on what is reality. Uh, Plato, in this painting by uh, Raphael, is pointing up, indicating his belief that true reality is in another world, not the physical world, but can only be known outside of the material universe. And then we saw that his pupil, Aristotle, took the opposite approach and said that true reality can only be known by studying the material universe, indicating, indicated in the painting by his holding his hands out in front of him, uh, looking at the world around. All right, there, there are only two more philosophies that I want to look at before we move on to other contributions, uh, and that is Epicureanism and Stoicism. Uh, Epicurus... Uh, Epicureanism is named after him, uh, believed that happiness and pleasure can be achieved through the avoidance of pain and fear. So avoid pain, embrace happiness, avoid, embrace pleasure, and uh, you'll be happy. If you want to be happier the rest of your life, avoid pain, embrace pleasure. Uh, and so, you know, you live for today. You don't worry about tomorrow. You know, think of the, the grassroots song back in the early 70s, I believe it was. Uh, Sha na la 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 la, live for today and don't worry about tomorrow. Hey, 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 hey. And if you know how to put hey, hey, hey's in a song, you can make anything rhyme. But that's uh, Epicureanism, living for today, going for the pleasure. You know, we had a, there was a, a commercial years ago that advised us to go for all the gusto you can. Uh, and of course, much of our advertising is based upon this embrace of pleasure. And so in many ways, our culture today could be termed as Epicurean. You might wonder about uh, something called hedonism, which is also a pursuit of pleasure, and, and that's simply a branch from Epicureanism. Uh, the other philosophy that we want to consider is what's called Stoicism. Uh, that comes from its founder, whose name was Zeno, not st Stoic. Stoic is a description of someone who is a, a follower of Stoicism. But uh, Zeno taught that uh, the fixed laws of the universe 
order the affairs of men and the universe. In other words, there, there are laws set in place. Everything is predetermined. And man must accept his fate and live a life of duty and self-control. So you can't change what happens to you. You can't change what did happen to you or what's going to happen to you. So just accept it. Don't get overly emotional about anything. Don't get so sad over things that happen to you that are bad. And don't get overly happy over things that happen to you that are good. Because you can't control any of it. The fates control it all. It's all determined. And so just live a life of duty, self-control, and uh, you'll be relatively happy. <laughs> uh, put on that stoic face you know, that does not show emotion. So those are, are two uh, philosophies that came about from the Greek culture that we find specifically these two reflected in the book of Acts when the Apostle Paul is in Athens and he is talking to the philosophers and he's talking to Epicureans and Stoics. Well, next we want to look at some other areas of contribution from the Greek world, contributions in the areas of science, medicine, and mathematics. Uh, first, uh, we want to look at Pythagoras. Now, technically, living in the 6th century BC, he was prior to the Golden Age. But his influence is so great, I've, I've included him here and because we didn't talk about him before. Uh, Pythagoras believed that the universe can be explained in mathematical terms. Uh, and that certainly is true. As, as scientists have discovered more and more about our universe, uh, they've come to accept the notion that our universe is mathematical. In fact, it was because, because of that that we are not only able to chart uh, the heavens uh, to, to determine uh, where uh, stars and constellations and the moon will be, uh, but also, of course, to uh, send someone to the moon. It's all based on mathematics. And, and uh, so Pythagoras is one that brought that idea forward. Most of us probably remember Pythagoras uh, because of the Pythagorean theorem that we had to learn in geometry. Do you remember that? Do you remember the Pythagorean theorem? Think of triangle. He said that the square of the hypotenuse, do you remember the hypotenuse? When you've got a triangle, you know, a right angle triangle, hypotenuse is the, the angle that goes between the, the two lines there. Uh, that the square of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Now, that, that's one of the easier theorems that you probably learn in geometry, uh, and he is the one who figured that out. <clears throat> However, it would come later during the Golden Age that a man by the name of Euclid uh, develops geometry even more, and he's considered really the father of geometry. He founded the School of Mathematics in Alexandria, uh, in Egypt, and he authored a textbook called Elements. Now, this occurs late in Greek culture, as Alexandria, uh, at the, the early stages, was not yet a city. Maybe you've heard of Archimedes. He was an inventor and a mathematician. He's the one that discovered the principle of the lever. You know how putting a, a, a plank down underneath something you want to move and putting something underneath the plank, you form a lever and are able to uh, do many things with a lever. Then we have Eratosthenes, who was an astronomer and a geographer, who determined the circumference of the earth as 28,800 miles. He figured that out mathematically. Now, the true figure we know today is 24,000 857 miles. So he wasn't very far off. This is without traveling around the earth, without going uh, probably out of Greece or the Greek world, and yet he figured that out within 4,000 miles. Amazing. Now, something else that you should notice is that he did believe that the earth was round. 
scuttle the notion that has been taught in our schools and, and seen, I've seen it in many textbooks that Columbus thought the world was round and everybody else thought it was flat. That simply is not true. They didn't forget what these earlier Greek scientists had taught. Uh, they knew the world was round. That wasn't the issue. The issue is, was uh, Eratosthenes correct in his understanding of how large the circumference of the earth was, or was Aristotle correct who thought it was much smaller? Columbus thought it was smaller. The other scholars of Western Europe thought that Eratosthenes uh, was correct. And guess what? Columbus was wrong. If he had not run into America, they would have died out there because of his miscalculation. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, Eratosthenes uh, is the one who also formulated the lines of longitude and latitude. So those lines we have on a globe to help us to know where we are in relationship to other places was formulated by this ancient Greek scientist. Well, next we come to Hippocrates. We mentioned him before. Uh, he is considered the father of medicine. And uh, his, his great pronouncement was that every disease has a natural cause, uh, thereby rejecting magic and superstition. And what did he recommend to remain healthy? Proper diet and rest. Hmm, that sounds like what I've heard many times. <laughs> Get enough rest, have a proper diet, and uh, that will go a long ways towards your remaining healthy. You know, not doing magic and not, you know, all the other things. Knocking on wood, not going to prevent you from getting sick. All right, uh, he wrote manuals. And he uh, also authored what we know as the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, this is the oath that uh, medical doctors are supposed to ascribe to. It says this, I swear by Apollo, the healer, uh, and we'll skip over the names there and all the gods, uh, uh, to keep according to my ability and my judgment the following oath and agreement. To consider dear to me as my parents, him who taught me this art. To live in common with him, and if necessary, to share my goods with him. To look upon his children as my own brothers, to teach them this art without, changing, without charging a fee. And that by my teaching, I will impart a knowledge of this art to my own sons and to my teacher's sons, and to disciples bound by an indenture and oath according to the medical laws and no other. So you know, he, he promises to, to help out his teachers and, and those who, who want to learn medicine. And maybe we can get a close up here so we can make sure we can read uh, what he has to say next. He says, I will prescribe regimens for the good of my patients according to my ability and my judgment and never do harm to anyone. <clears throat> You've probably heard that before. Never do harm. Next he says, I will not give a lethal drug to anyone if I am asked nor will I advise such a plan. So, no, no assisted suicide from Hippocrates. The next he says is, similarly, I will not give a woman a pessary to cause an abortion. So, no abortion in the original Hippocratic Oath. Never do harm, <clears throat> no assisted suicide, no abortion. He says, but I will preserve the purity of my life and my arts. I will not cut for stone, even for patients in whom the disease is manifest. In other words, I won't perform surgery arbitrarily. I will leave this operation to be performed by practitioners, specialists in this art. So surgery can be done by those that are trained in surgery. Uh, in every house where I come, I will enter only for the good of my patients, keeping myself far from all intentional ill-doing and all seduction, and especially from the pleasures of love with women or with men, be they free or slaves. So when he makes a house call, he's just there for the patient, not to take advantage of anybody there in a sexual way. All that may come to my knowledge in the exercise of my profession or in daily commerce with men, which ought not to be spread abroad, I will keep secret and will never reveal. 
If he hears something there, he doesn't tell it. No spreading of rumors. It's confidentiality. If I keep this oath faithfully, may I enjoy my life and practice my art, respected by all men and in all times. But if I swerve from it or violate it, may the reverse be my lot. Oh boy. I think there are a lot of physicians today that uh, we could say have not kept that oath faithfully. Well, that's the Hippocratic Oath. I hope that you found that revealing. All right, uh, next we come to achievements in literature. Uh, the first person we want to look at in a division of literature, which is history, is the one who's called the father of history, and that is Herodotus. Herodotus uh, has given us a lot of information about many historical events. However, <clears throat> he sometimes includes myths and exaggerations. Uh, I have found particularly the one he is estimating the sizes of armies that um, he, he, he gives us numbers that just don't seem likely. But he does give us a lot of good information too. And so there's much to be gained by Herodotus. However, a more accurate and objective historian, uh, according to those who have researched these things, is a man by the name of Thucydides. Uh, so there's a lot to be gained from the ancient world by uh, looking at these men. Another division of literature is drama. Uh, drama was seen as an educational tool. Uh, drama educated the Greek people in religious beliefs, in moral behavior, and civic pride. So what do you see absent there? Entertainment, <laughs> amusement, you don't find that. Drama had a purpose. And that was primarily education in these three areas. By the way, do you know what the word amusement means? Well, it comes from the Greek words. Muse means to think. You may have heard people using the word in that way, to muse about something. Or we think about the muses uh, from uh, Greek times. The muses were uh, those that uh, composed poems, and music comes from that. But when you put an A in front of a Greek word, that negates the word. So amuse means to not think. Amusement is engaging in practices which don't involve your brain or thought. So drama was not for amusement. Drama had a purpose. There were three types of drama. There was comedy, satyr plays, and tragedy. We'll look at each of them. In comedy, uh, the first the com of the comedies that were written were mainly satirical and mocked men in power for their vanity and foolishness. Uh, the first master of comedy <clears throat> was the playwright Aristophanes. Much later, Menander wrote comedies about ordinary people and made his plays more like sitcoms. But they still had a point. Uh, the next kind of play is the tragedy. Uh, tragedy dealt with the big themes of law, love, loss, pride, the abuse of power, and uh, the, the difficult relationships between men and gods. Typically, the main protagonist of a tragedy commits some terrible crime without realizing how foolish and arrogant he has been. Then, as he slowly realizes his error, the world crumbles around him. Uh, you can see some of these kind of themes even in our sitcoms. Uh, the, the basic way you deal with a drama hasn't changed a lot. Uh, the three great playwrights of tragedy were Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. 
Now, Aristotle argued that tragedy cleansed the heart through pity and terror, purging us of our petty concerns and worries by making us aware that there can be nobility in suffering. What? Advocating suffering as a means of cleansing? Wow, that wouldn't go well today, would it? He called this experience catharsis, which means cleansing. So there can be cleansing through watching drama in which uh, there is something going on that's difficult. Well, next and lastly are the satyr plays. These short plays were performed between acts of tragedies and made fun of the plight of the tragedy's characters. So instead of commercials, they had short plays which made fun of the characters that are in the tragedy. The satyrs uh, were mythical half-human, half-goat figures, and actors in these plays, in order to appear even more comical, wore large phalluses. Few examples of these plays survive. They are classified by some authors as tragicomic or comedy dramas. The one who is given credit for establishing drama in 534 BC, according to, to tradition, was a man by the name of Thespis. And actors today are called thespians after him. Uh, a writer of tragedy, the most famous of those, was a man by the name of Sophocles. And you may find him referred to in, in some plays or in other uh, dramatic pieces. Uh, Aristophanes was the premier writer of comedy. Now, in order to have drama, in order to have a play, you have to have what? A theater. And so theaters began to dominate Greece and then later the Roman world. Uh, here is a picture of the theater of Dionysius uh, below the Parthenon in Athens. Uh, the seats would have been extended all the way up the hillside. Uh, the first plays were performed in this theater, which was built in the shadow of the Acropolis in Athens at the beginning of the 5th century. Uh, but the theaters proved to be so popular that soon they spread all over Greece. Uh, the next we're going to look at the, the Great Theater, which goes back uh, into, past the Roman world into the Greek world, um, which... Uh, uh, had theater performances, assemblies, and then later on in the Roman period, uh, gladiator events. Uh, here is a picture of then this great theater, which is in the city of Ephesus, built in the 4th century B.C. Uh, you can see how high it is uh, there. You can see the, uh, the stage area that is uh, below and uh, behind the stage, uh, what was the, the backstage area, uh, where people would uh, uh, change costumes and so on. Uh, this is the great theater of, Ath of Ephesus, uh, which is in Asia Minor, part of the Roman world. Um, here's another picture of the seats, which would accommodate 24,000 spectators. Amazing. And, and if you climb up to the top, um, you can hear somebody down on the stage speaking. Great acoustics. Um, here's another picture of the same area, looking at the stone seats. Uh, another one of the great theater of Ephesus. Now, the certain specifications for being in a play, uh, there were no special costumes or scenery. Uh, they used masks to identify the character and as an amplifier. The word for an actor then came to be the word hypocrite which means someone wearing a mask. Uh, later on, of course, the hypocrite began to be used to describe a person who is behind a mask. Not a literal one, but one which uh, they are putting forth. So they're a hypocrite because their mask is not what they really were. And here's an example of some of the masks, as well as um, so a couple statues of actors wearing their masks. Now, by the way, uh, only men 
could act in these dramas. And so if they were portraying a woman, how was that designated to the audience? By the mask. There was also a chorus of men that commented on the action and eventually included dances. The dancing took place in front of the actors on a platform called the orchestra from the Greek word to dance. Now, eventually, this orchestra in more modern times in front of the stage was the place where the music was played. And so the word orchestra was the name of the place first before it became the name of the musicians who played because they were seated in the orchestra so eventually those playing the music were called the orchestra. And when they decided to lower that stage because they were no longer dancing, people didn't need to see them dancing, they just needed to hear the music, so then it became the orchestra pit because it was lower than the stage. Uh, actors were held in high esteem and they received a small remuneration from the state. Plays were not for profit, but as an act of worship to the gods. Another area we want to look at was the excellence of the Greek culture in art. Uh, these are urns, and on urns they portrayed scenes of everyday life, battles, athletic competitions, and activities of their gods. Uh, the vases had a different shape for different uses. Uh, ones with the fisherman and hunter were oil jugs. The large one with two handles was used for storing wine or oil. On this one we see the story of Odysseus against the Cyclops pictured on a vase. On the left hand side we see a vase painting of Achilles, the bravest Greek hero in the Iliad. On the upper right we see uh, the figures are unpainted in this vase. Except for a few little lines, the figures keeping the natural color of the clay because the, pay, the vase was painted black. I, I understand, I don't even know how you'd paint figures, let alone paint the background, leaving the figures of the natural color of the vase. That, that is just remarkable to me that that could be done. Uh, the, uh, and that's called a red figured vase. On the lower right, we see a school scene showing how boys of ancient Greece were taught music and poetry. Uh, pictured is one student playing the lyre with his teacher and another standing before his reading teacher and a man with a cane who is the boy's pedagogue. The pedagogue is the servant who brought him to school. Uh, he was the one who protected him on the way to school and home, but also remained at school to make sure that the young man paid attention in his classes. Quite often he'd have a stick and he could, you know, get the boy's attention by uh, wrapping him a little bit, um, wake up, pay attention to the teacher, and uh, was kind of responsible uh, by the family for the education of the child. Not doing the educating, but doing the discipline. And our modern word for education is pedagogy, uh, which comes from this. Our last vase shows a scene from a play portrayed on this vase. So we find a lot about Greek life simply on the vases. Uh, if you go to, if you live near Cleveland, uh, in the Cleveland, Cleveland Museum of Art, they have a lot of vases there with the different scenes from Greek life that you might find enjoyable. Now, we're partway through looking at the, the culture of, of the Greek civilization and uh, many things which have influenced us to this day. The next time we're going to be looking at another area, and that is sculpture on discovering his story. What's the real story? How did all of this come to be? Was it all by chance, or did something or someone design everything? Join us as we learn from our host, William Henry, and discover that the story of the Earth and our universe is really his story.